Hello, uh, this is Derek L. Forward, president of the Dayton unit of the NAACP. Welcome to our monthly community meeting this evening, uh, titled Community, community Centered Policing, uh, a Force for Change. Uh, Reverend Dr. Hello, Dave, uh, David Derek I. Fox Ford, president of the Dayton unit. will serve as Hello. our moderator Welcome and he will introduce his guest. This evening, uh, titled Community, community Reverend Fox. Policing. A force for change. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, to um, our executive committee and members of NAACP, to our great State Representative uh, Phil Plummer, and to uh, members and friends and those who are looking on from Facebook, I'd like to present to some and introduce to others our guest speaker tonight, Carlton T. Mayers, the second Esquire. He is the founder of and owner of and head consultant of Mayor's Strategic Solutions, LLC. He brings uh, years of experience fighting for social justice and criminal legal system reform. He was a uh, senior policy manager for criminal justice reform uh, at the Heartland Alliance. Uh, he was also supervising field director of the criminal justice uh, and juvenile reform with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, he also worked as a policy counsel for the policing reform campaign, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education you know, Fund, Inc. And he also uh, served as a criminal justice program manager and interim director of the NAACP National Headquarters. And finally, he did a great work as one who served as prisoner for reentry me mediation and partnership specialist with the America Corps out of um, Montgomery County, Maryland. We have such talent with us tonight who will talk to us about a very important subject matter, community-centered policing. And we are just so happy to have him. He is a national figure, speaks all over the country, works with numerous police departments and cities and communities trying to bring about solutions to those areas in which there is conflict between police and the citizens. I now bring you Mr. Mayors in his own way. And will you come on, Mr. Mayors, and give us uh, a presentation that we'll be glad to hear, and we appreciate you being here. Well, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. You know, you have to make sure with these yes. uh, vir these virtual meetings. Uh, so thank you for having me. I want to say, uh, number one, uh, happy birthday to President Forward. I've been doing work with President Forward for years, ever since I directed NAACP National's Criminal Justice Reform Program. And also want to say thank you to uh, the criminal justice chair, Dr. Fox. He and I had an amazing call right before uh, today's event. So I'm looking forward to doing more work with both of them. Also with um, Mr. Roberts, Tom Roberts, who I've met uh, on occasion uh, during the NAACP national conventions and also with the uh, Region 3 Kertais. So uh, very, very happy to be reunited with the uh, Ohio State Conference and the Dayton uh, Ohio branch, especially to talk about such an important issue that as we all know, especially as of today, seems to be the number one hot topic in America right now. What are we going to do about policing reform and reimagining public safety in America? We've already gone down different directions in the past, considering the 1968 omnibus bill 
that President LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson passed back in those days. Then looking at 1994 crime bill that our current president authored and was passed by Bill Clinton when he was president and then moving fast forwarding, right? Into before the Trump era, what happened with President Obama, the first African-American president in the United States of America. He did a lot on 21st century policing within that eight year period that he was president. So now we are in a, a very interesting situation in America where we're not only in a post Trump era, but most importantly, we are in a post January 6 era where we saw several law enforcement officers who were off duty that took time out of their day to travel to DC to do an attempted coup of our government. So this is the situation we're in right now as it relates to policing reform in America. And ever since then, what have we seen? We've seen George Floyd, we've seen Breonna Taylor, we've seen Jacob Blake and others. So what I'm gonna do for you today, I have a, a, a wonderful presentation. Oop, can everybody just pause, I'm sorry. I have a wonderful presentation and slides for you that I'm going to present to you today. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off my video and I'm hoping that the host will allow me to share my screen. So that way I can show you the slides and start my presentation. So whoever the host is, please allow me the ability to share my screen. Thank you very much. And let me know when, when I'm able to share it so that way I can get the presentation started. Uh, you should be good, Attorney Myers. Okay, thank you. Yep, I see it. Okay. So here we go. All right, we're going to get started now. And I'm going to take off my video so you can focus on the slides I put for you. And okay. All right, we're going to get started. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay, perfect. And just real quick, let me know if you see them now. Do you see the slides now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you see the transition? Yep. yep. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm gonna get started then. Thank you. Okay, so good evening. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today about community empowerment centered policing reform. Through my consulting company, Mayor Strategic Solutions LLC, we work with communities across the country on reimagining public safety by establishing their own policing reforms centered on community empowerment through an approach that I developed and informed by my years of experience as a community lawyer called the CAP method, which stands for C for community empowerment, A for accountability, and T for transparency. In the aftermath of the tragic police killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and Daniel Prude, and the unjustified shooting of Jacob Blake, and the more recent officer involved deaths and shootings that have occurred since the Derek Chauvin guilty verdicts. There is once again increased public awareness and attention to police violence against people, especially persons of color, which has caused a decline in the public's confidence in law enforcement and galvanized a call for police accountability. However, there will not be true police accountability until the underlying issue of policing is addressed. What is this issue? Well, this issue is the power disparity that exists between law enforcement who are tasked to protect and serve their communities and community members whose taxpayer dollars pay for law enforcement salaries and pensions. In this relational dynamic, law enforcement can use lethal force without accountability on a community member who simply makes quote unquote furtive movements. But due to qualified immunity, community members are not even able to sue individual officers for alleged misconduct. To this end, this power disparity must be balanced and communities must be empowered to change law enforcement policies, practices, and culture in order to eradicate police misconduct and establish sustainable and long-standing policing reform. This is important because ultimately community members and law enforcement need to work together as one community to support public safety and ensure police accountability through more so proactive rather than reactive strategies. So more specifically, looking at policing in America through a historical lens, 
We need to talk about, as you can see here on the slide, the birth of the Black Codes and enforcement of vagrancy laws. The Black Codes, also called Black Laws, were laws governing the conduct of free Black Americans. The most well-known of them were passed in 1865 and 1866 by Southern states after the Civil War in order to restrict Black Americans' freedom and to force them to work for low wages. Before the Civil War, Northern states that had prohibited slavery also enacted Black Codes to discourage free Black Americans from residing in those states. They were denied equal political rights, including the right to vote, the right to attend public schools, the right to equal such as loitering and commit them to involuntary labor. This period was the start of the convict lease system, which is the birth of mass incarceration in the US today. Fast forwarding to contemporary times, there are still challenges in policing, which are demonstrated by, as you can see here on the slide, persons shot and killed by law enforcement nationwide in 2020. So all the information that I'm gonna to describe to you on this slide you can find on the Washington Post website. So in 2020, there were 1,021 persons shot and killed by law enforcement nationwide. Black people were nearly a quarter, 25%. That's 243 out of 1,021 of those killed, despite being only 13% of the overall US population. Also, the racial disparity is even more pronounced among unarmed victims shot and killed by law enforcement. 55 people out of 1,021 were killed by law enforcement. They were unarmed. And 18 out of those 55 people were black people. That means that nearly a third of the unarmed people who were shot and killed by law enforcement nationwide in 2020 we're black people. Lastly, nearly 20% of people, that's 213 out of 1,021, had a mental illness and were shot and killed by law enforcement. Now, some additional data well, uh, that I want to talk about, something else we know, is that according to a sociological study that was published in 2016, immediately following and for more than a year after the highly publicized assault or death of a black person at the hands of law enforcement, black Americans are less likely to dial 911. All of this demonstrates that not ensuring police accountability does not support public safety. Now, I also wanna add in some additional data sets that I think are more current that are relevant to what we're talking about today. And this data I'm about to talk about you can find on the mappingpoliceviolence.com website. So data from mappingpoliceviolence.com demonstrates that police have killed on average about 1,000 people per year since 2015. And that black people make up, as I said earlier, generally only 13% of the general US population, but represent at least 28% of those killed by law enforcement since 2013. Black men more specifically, are about 2.5 times more likely to be killed by police than white men. And black women are about 1.4 times more likely to be killed by police than white women. And also about one in 1,000 black men and boys can expect to be killed by law enforcement. Now, in 2020, according to mappingpoliceviolence.com, there were 121 people who were killed by law enforcement across the nation during traffic stops. This is something that's coming up a lot right now. And we've all known that this is an issue. Johnny Cochran talked about it years ago, but now this is right in the public's view because of body-worn cameras and camera phones. And so even though black people, even though these traffic stops account for about, they, they account for about 10% of all fatal police encounters, that is not good. And so when we look at how often are law enforcement officers arrested and charged for all of this unnecessary anti-Black violence and death, well, 
98.3% of killings by law enforcement from 2013 to 2020 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. And few cases ever go to trial and even fewer still get convicted. And so we've seen that with the Derek Chauvin trial, we know that this is not a regular thing to get an all guilty verdict in a case like this. And so just to let you know, as of today, there is at least 335 people in the United States of America who've been killed by law enforcement in 2021. That is the current year that we're living in. And we're not even in May yet. We're not even halfway through the year. And there's already at least 335 individuals that have been killed by law enforcement nationwide. So considering all of this, what are the solutions? Well, let's talk about it. First, let's talk about what's happening on the national level, because there's a lot happening in the US Congress right now related to policing reform. So as we all know, last year after George Floyd's death and Breonna Taylor's death, there was global, not just national, but a global response calling for Black Lives Matter and defund police. In response to those demands, Congresswoman Karen Bass from California introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Now this legislation passed out of the House last year. However, it did not make its way through the Senate. It did not get voted out of the Senate and therefore it died in the Senate. But this year, as we all know, this bill has been reintroduced by a Congresswoman Karen Bass and once again has been passed out of the House and is now being negotiated in the Senate with Senators Cory Booker and Senator Tim Scott out of South Carolina, Republican, Senator Cory Booker out of New Jersey, Democrat. So what I'm gonna do for you real quick, I'm just gonna highlight some bullet points that are just important to know. There's more in this bill than what you see on this slide, but just some bullet points on what exactly is in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So for instance, this legislation would prohibit federal, state, and local law enforcement from racial, religious, and discriminatory profiling. It would also reform qualified immunity so that individuals are not barred from recovering damages when law enforcement violate their constitutional rights. In addition to this, it would ban chokehold, carotid holes, and no-knock warrants at the federal level. And it would limit the transfer of military-style equipment from state and to state and local police departments. It would also create law enforcement development and training programs to develop best practices based on the 21st century police uh, task force, policing task force report recommendations that were published in 2015 under the Obama administration. And then lastly, not the last point in the bill, but just lastly on the bullets I have here, it would establish a national police misconduct registry to prevent problematic officers who were fired or leave an agency from moving to another jurisdiction without any accountability, okay? So I also wanna talk a little bit about another piece of federal legislation that was also introduced last year in response to Congresswoman Karen Bass's uh, Justice and Policing Act. And that was the Justice Act, which was introduced by Senator Tim Scott out of South Carolina last year. Now, what that legislation would do is it would improve and reform policing practices, accountability, and transparency through various incentives, such as funding for body-worn cameras, de-escalation training, and includes language from the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill to fund investigation of cold lynching cases. So essentially, the difference with the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the Justice Act is that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act has what I call a combination of sticks and carrots. Sticks means that it contains limits and restrictions and accountability within it so that if law enforcement does what they're not supposed to do, or they don't do what they're supposed to do, there's going to be accountability written into this and it's going to be enforced. Now the carrots, and on the other hand, that's more like providing law enforcement with money and resources in hopes that they will implement national evidence-based best practices. Now that's the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. When we look at the Justice Act, that doesn't contain any sticks. It only contains carrots, meaning that it only provides money and resources to law enforcement around the country in hopes that they will implement uh, national evidence-based best practices. So at this point, the way it's looking is that whatever comes out of Congress 
in regards to policing reform will probably be a combination of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the Justice Act that the Republicans introduced last year. So we're all kind of waiting to see what's gonna happen. And I'm sure we're gonna find out by, I believe it's May 25th, the anniversary of George Floyd's death. That's when they hope to have that bill passed out of Congress and on Biden's desk to be signed. So now let's talk more about what's going on on the state and local level, what could be happening to bring about the kind of changes that communities want to see when it comes to reimagining public safety. So as I said earlier, I work with communities across the country on reimagining public safety through community empowerment centered policing reform. And the vehicle for community empowerment centered policing reform is the CAP method. And as you could see here, the CAP method consists of three components and each component must be achieved in order for the CAP method to be successful. So let's start with the first component and that's community empowerment. So this component entails community members being involved in, having knowledge of, and having at least 50% voting power. I'm gonna repeat that, at least 50% voting power over all police activities that are directly related to police civilian interactions, such as stops, arrests, uses of force, surveillance technology, military style equipment, the way that protests are handled, et cetera. Now, another important aspect of the community empowerment component is that those community members who are from those neighborhoods and zip codes in the community where there's high levels of negative police interactions like racial profiling, excessive use of force, sexual misconduct, et cetera. Those community members especially need to be involved in, need to have knowledge of, and need to have at least 50% voting power over all police activities that are directly related to police civilian interactions. And the reason for this is because these are the community members who are exposed to negative police interactions on a regular basis. And they know people who are exposed to negative police interactions on a regular basis. And so because of that, they essentially have their fingers on the pulse on if community police relations are truly improving or not. And so for instance, when we look at Ferguson, Missouri, well, we're not talking about wards one and two, we're talking about community members from ward three, which is where Mike Brown was from and where Mike Brown was killed. For instance, Chicago, we're not talking about the north side of Chicago. We're talking about the south side and west side community members from those communities, because that's what the US Department of Justice highlighted in their pattern of practice investigation of the Chicago Police Department that has ultimately resulted in the ongoing consent decree in Chicago. So the next component is accountability. And this involves creating an inhospitable environment for law enforcement officers who engage in misconduct by establishing both internal and external accountability mechanisms that would work together. So when I say an internal accountability mechanism, I mean one that's within a police department. A good example is an early intervention system that allows supervisors to monitor the conduct of their rank and file officers to make sure that they're adhering to departmental policies and training. And if they're not, to then intervene through remedial training and or uh, counseling. And if the circumstances call for it, to then advance the situation to disciplinary action that could ultimately result in the officer's suspension or termination. Now, when I talk about, when I'm saying an external accountability mechanism, I mean one that's outside of the police department. For instance, a civilian oversight authority like the Civilian Complaint Review Board that has both subpoena and disciplinary powers. And so this would be a Civilian Complaint Review Board that would consist only of civilians and would be tasked with receiving complaints from other civilians about misconduct in their community. And they would have the power to subpoena anyone or any materials that are related to the complaint for their investigation. And if as a result of their investigation, they find that the officer did engage in misconduct, they can then advance discipline that could ultimately result in the suspension or termination of the officer. Now, the last component is transparency. Now, typically, transparency is defined as law enforcement agencies being above board with their communities about police activities. A good example is uh, public reporting of traffic stop data, public reporting of use of force data. I actually think that speaks more to accountability 
than it does to transparency. Because at the end of the day, in order to solve a problem, you have to first know what the problem is. And in order to hold a law enforcement officer and or a law enforcement agency accountable for misconduct, you have to first have a record of that misconduct, as we saw in the Derek Chauvin trial. So I actually think that speaks more to accountability. Now, my definition for transparency is more global. And what it is is that I define transparency as the interconnectedness and coordination amongst what I call the four aspects of the community, as you can see here on the next slide. So first we have law enforcement. This includes the sheriff's office, state and local police, including the county police. Next we have elected and appointed government officials, including governmental agencies. Then we have community members. This includes community-based organizations, direct service providers, directly impacted individuals. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm also gonna include the local businesses. We see what's going on in Georgia around voting rights. Now business is getting involved in social justice reform. So I'm looking at them getting involved in policing reform as well. And then last but not least, who's typically not included in the discussions on policing reform, but still has a substantial impact, especially on police accountability, is the local press and news media. And we see this in how the local press and news media depict victims of police violence compared to law enforcement. So according to my definition of transparency, all four of these aspects of the community would need to work together with in coordination and interconnectedness to have that high level of clarity amongst each other and how they're gonna function working together as one community to support public safety and ensure police accountability through more so proactive rather than reactive strategies. So what I'd like to do for you now is I'm going to go through an illustration, a demonstration of how uh, the cap method could be applied to body worn cameras, which we all know this is a huge subject right now. Just look at what's going on in Elizabeth City, um, North Carolina. We also know about what's happened most recently in Columbus, Ohio with the Micaiah Bryant case. And we also know other cases time and time again, we're seeing more and more body worn camera footage. So now we're gonna talk about how can community empowerment apply to that. But first, before I talk about that, I do wanna make a few more points about the CAP method, just so that you have a full understanding of what I'm talking about. So the CAP method is not a cure-all. I wanna make sure that you're clear on that. This is not a cure-all, but it is a contributing factor for solutions on policing reform and reimagining public safety. And it contributes to the solution by not telling communities what the solution is, but instead asking those communities what solutions they want to see in their individual communities. And also the CAP method is flexible and adaptive and can apply to community policing, divestment from police, defund police, or even none of them. And instead apply to something very different. You know, we're talking about reimagining public safety. That means we could do anything at this point, right? It doesn't have to fall into a category. And so, you know, the reason why this is important is because public safety and policing reform, these are not black and white issues, okay? There's actually a lot of gray area in this space. And there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to policing reform and public safety, because every community is different. And this is based on the community's history, the community's demographics and its culture. For instance, Dayton, Ohio has a very different community from Cincinnati, which is different from Cleveland which is different from Columbus, but all of those communities are located in the same state. And the reason why they're different is because they have different histories, different demographics, different culture, et cetera. All of that needs to align, or at least policing, policing reform and public safety needs to align with all of those factors in order for it to work. So for instance, you could implement a body worn camera uh, program in all of those jurisdictions and the way it's implemented will look different because each one of them are different jurisdictions. All of that needs to be factored in and the CAP method does that. And so, you know, just to give you a, a, a metaphor of what the CAP method is, the, the best way I can envision it for you is that the CAP method is like a mold of clay, you know, like before you like turn that mold of clay into art, it's just like this big mold of clay, no shape, you put it on a machine and the machine spins 
And then you have the artist that sits in front of the mold of clay in the machine and they put their hands into that mold of clay and use their imagination to start crafting and sculpting the clay into what it is they want it to be. So in other words, the clay itself is the cap method, right? The machine, that's my consulting company. And then the artist, which is gonna be, that's gonna be the community. And so the community puts their hands into the cap method, into that mold of clay and starts to apply the community's list of demands, whatever the community imagines for what they want to see for public safety. And the CAP method provides a structure on how they can do that. And then I provide as the machine, I guide them and how they go about doing that. So that at the end of the day, whatever it is that they want to create is created. And most importantly, is implemented effectively. And that's what the CAP method does. And because it does that, this will result in ownership and public safety, uh, ownership of public safety and policing reforms, which will ultimately result and a long-term commitment to keeping these efforts going. So for instance, you know, we see how like there's a pandemic happening right now. We see how there's been an uptick in gun violence in most cities across the country since last year. With those kinds of external circumstances, which can change right at any time, when you have community empowerment centered policing reform baked into your policing reform, no matter what external circumstances happen, the community being law enforcement, community members, the government and the news media will work together as one community to navigate that storm and to adapt to the changes for long-term solutions to a long-term problem. We don't want short-term solutions to a long-term problem. And so what I'm gonna do now is, now that I've said that, let's start talking about how the CAP method would apply to body-worn cameras. Okay. And of course, any questions you have, we'll talk about once I'm done. We have a whole Q&A section uh, dedicated to, you know, questions and answer. So let's start off with the community empowerment component. Now, you remember I said earlier, this component entails community members, especially from those neighborhoods where there's high levels of negative police interactions to be involved in, have knowledge of, and have at least 50% voting power over all police activities that are directly related to police civilian interactions. So how this could look and how it's already been done, to be honest, uh, with communities is that a law enforcement agency, for instance, can hold a series of town hall meetings with their community members on the body worn camera policy and on any modifications made to the body worn camera policy. And uh, this has actually already been done. Uh, for instance, in 2014, the Camden County Police Department, they held a series of, by, of uh, town hall meetings with their community members to educate them on the body worn camera policy draft and then to receive feedback from them and capture that feedback included in the final draft of the body worn camera policy and in the implementation of that body worn camera policy. Like I said, none of this is novel. This has been done. This is just the first time somebody's ever put it all into a process through the CAP method. Uh, and then another thing that could be done is also to create a governing board or an advisory body of community leaders and members that could also meet with their law enforcement to go over the body worn camera policy. Now I know Tucson, Arizona's police department, you know, we all know Arizona is a red state. Some people might say it's Trump country. Tucson, Arizona's police department for almost four years now has already been doing this where they've had a select group of community members meeting with their law enforcement around issues like body worn camera policy and modification of that policy to capture their input and make sure that it's included in the final draft of the policy and in its implementation. So this is already happening around the country. Okay, next we have the accountability component. So don't forget, I said earlier, this involves creating an inhospitable environment for law enforcement officers who engage in misconduct by establishing both internal and external accountability mechanisms, which would work together. So how this would look in regards to an internal accountability mechanism is that you could have law enforcement agencies that mandate that their supervisors conduct random reviews of the body worn camera video and audio footage of their rank and file officers. Now, this is actually a recommendation that the Obama administration's DOJ made in the 2014 body worn camera toolkit that the DOJ published in that year. Now, uh, I also know there's a number of police and law enforcement agencies around the country that are already doing these random reviews. So that way they can see if the rank and file officers are adhering to departmental policies and trainings. 
and to also make sure that if there's anything that happens, like use of force, for instance, that they're reporting it to their supervisors. And if not, then there's going to be discipline. So that's an excellent internal accountability mechanism. Now, an external accountability mechanism, for instance, could be having a civilian oversight authority, like a civilian complaint review board, that would be that would have the ability to review the body worn camera video and audio footage of officer involved critical incidents. So when I say an officer involved critical incidents, I'm talking about officer involved shootings, officer involved deaths, pretty much any kind of situation where somebody has been significantly injured or died from off from law enforcement. And so we can have civilian complaint review boards review that footage and then advance discipline if misconduct has occurred. And guess what? Once again, this is not novel. This has already been happening in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, another red state. OK, I'm just going to emphasize that with you, because sometimes people say, oh, this stuff can't be done in a red state. And actually, it's being done. It's been done for years now. OK, so in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they've had their fire and police commission, which is their civilian oversight for decades now. And a matter of fact, they have so much power that last year, their fire and police commission demoted their, the police chief for the Milwaukee Police Department, which ultimately resulted in his termination. So that's a lot of power for, for a civilian complaint review board to have. And that speaks to community empowerment. That's what we want to see. OK, so now the last component is transparency. And like I said earlier, I define that as the interconnectedness and coordination amongst the four aspects of the community being law enforcement, government officials, community members, and the news media working together as one community. And so what that would look like in regards to body worn cameras is, for instance, law enforcement agencies could establish uh, and mandate the early or the release of video and audio footage of officer involved critical incidents to the victim's families and to community leaders within 24 hours from when the incident occurred. And then they would be mandated to release the, the, uh, the footage to the general public within 48 hours to 72 hours from the incident. Okay, now this is important because this speaks to the importance of honesty with the community and the consideration of the trauma experienced by the community from viewing the, uh, the body worn camera footage and also listening to the audio footage of these officer involved critical incidents. And we're seeing this play out right now when we look at what's happening in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And what we've seen even in the past in Chicago, Illinois, I think most recently the Adam Toledo case of the 13 year old who was shot. It was a while before that body worn camera footage was released. We've seen that even in Chicago with the Anjanette Young case, African American woman who you know, the Chicago police had uh, done, a, they had mistakenly executed a search warrant on her property and had her standing up half naked and were, mis and were disrespecting her in her home. We've even seen this years ago in Chicago with the Laquan McDonald case where they held on to that footage, that dash cam footage for years before it surfaced. And we saw this last year around the time that George Floyd had died with the Daniel Prude case in Rochester, New York, where you had an African-American gentleman who was suffering from mental illness. He was in crisis. Law enforcement tried to restrain him and ultimately killed him. OK, and so what ended up happening as a result of that, the uh, law enforcement tried to sweep the situation under the rug and supposedly even lied to the mayor of the city of Rochester. That led to protests in the streets and ultimately led to the police chief and all of the leadership in the Rochester Police Department to resign because they lost the trust and the confidence of their community. So what we need to do is focus on how can we be constructive when it comes to handling these situations by proactively, not reactively, but more so proactively strategizing how we're going to deal with this going forward so that we have constructive outcomes, OK? Because think about it. If you let the family members and the community leaders know first, this is what's going on. That allows the community leaders to go back to the community and prepare them for the, the trauma they're going to experience when that footage is made public. And of course, there's going to be a backlash. We're human beings. That's organic. OK, that's natural. But that can be handled in a more constructive manner if we strategize about this more so proactively rather than reactively. I'm sorry to say this, but more than likely, governments are more so reactive than proactive. We saw that in Brooklyn City, Brooklyn uh, Center in Minneapolis after the Dante Wright case when those the way that the protests were handled, right? We've seen this time and time again. It's time for us to change the playbook. 
and start to do things differently. And that means we need to be more proactive rather than reactive. And that's what the CAP method does. It allows communities to be more proactive and start planning and implementing. And so now what I'm gonna do for you is I wanna talk just a little bit before I wrap it up about the work I've done here in Illinois with the Legislative Black Caucus and the Lieutenant Governor's Office to provide feedback on the uh, criminal justice reform package legislation that was recently passed into law about two months ago here in Illinois called the SAFE, then the letter T Act. So the SAFE T Act. And essentially that's the big criminal justice uh, legislation that has sentencing reform in it, has bail reform in it, and has policing reform. I provided feedback just on the policing reform piece. And so this right here, what I have on the slide for you, this is one of the provisions that I provided feedback on that speaks to community empowerment centered policing reform. So we're gonna go through this real quick. So this is mandatory law enforcement officer trainings. So now under the Safety Act, all law enforcement agencies that are not Illinois State Police, so that means the sheriffs, the local police, the county police, only them, anytime they do their crisis intervention techniques trainings for new recruits and in-service officers. So we're not talking about the Citizen Academy. We're not talking about the Youth Academy. We're talking about the actual mandatory law enforcement officer trainings. Those trainings now must be done in collaboration among law enforcement professionals, mental health providers in the community, the family members of individuals with mental illness in the community, and consumer advocates, and must minimally include the following components, learning from family members of individuals with mental illness and their experiences, and verbal de-escalation training and role plays. So number one, I wanna let y'all know, this is a really big deal, okay? There is no other state in the United States of America right now that has a law on the books that requires non-law enforcement affiliated community members to participate in mandatory law enforcement officer trainings. This is the first time this has happened. Okay, now I'm hoping this is not going to be the last time. I want other states to replicate this, including Ohio, because I believe this is going to be one solution when we're talking about police accountability and community police relations. We need to have community participation and trainings that are directly related to police civilian interactions. And so, just to let you know why this is important, number one, when we're talking about first responder deployments for in crisis situations, when somebody has a mental health illness or if they have a substance abuse Ill, uh, uh, situation going on, who should be the first ones to respond to that situation? Should it be a mental health professional who's unarmed? Should it be law enforcement who's trained in crisis intervention techniques? Or should it be a combination of the two? Or should it be an unmanned drone, okay? These are the four options that communities around the country are looking at right now. What I'm saying is this, regardless of whichever approach a community decides to do, don't forget what I said earlier, there's no one size fits all approach to policing reform. At the end of the day, when you include all the stakeholders in the same room during this training, they are essentially proactively strategizing how to address these situations if and when they occur in their particular communities. And why is that? Because you have the family members of people in your community who have mental illness who now have to be a part of these trainings. You have the mental health providers in your community who now have to be a part of these trainings. And those are two key people or just parties right there whose input and feedback need to be a part of the strategizing, because at the end of the day, what we want, we want people coming out of these situations unharmed, and most importantly, we want them coming out alive. We want them coming out alive. That's both law enforcement and civilians. So we have to proactively strategize. And the best way to do that, one best way, is through the trainings, okay? And so just to tell you some more about this, another reason why this is important is because, look, it, this is not going to be your typical, we're going to sit down and lecture to you kind of training. It requires that they capture the input of the family members of people with mental illness in the community. So that means that it also requires role playing and verbal de-escalation training. So people are not going to be sitting down 
you know, writing notes. They're going to be watching. They're going to be getting up out of their seats. They're going to be engaging. They're going to be looking at role plays. They're going to be talking about it as a group. According to the Police Executive Research Forum, it's called PERF. That is a nonprofit organization that does research and studies specifically for law enforcement agencies around the country, okay, that provides national evidence-based best practices. Their study that they came out with in 2016 showed that if law enforcement officers' trainings are scenario-based, involve role-playing, and are hands-on, there is a much less likelihood that there's a, there's a much less, there's a higher likelihood that those law enforcement officers will actually utilize what they learned in their trainings in the field where it matters the most, okay? So we wanna make sure that there involves role playing and that it also involves community members. So that way, they, it's a two way street. Community members can learn about why law enforcement does what they do. And then also can inform law enforcement, well, I see what you do and I understand why, but I think you could still do it this other way. And it allows law enforcement to think out of the box and start adapting in line with what their communities wants to see. And that's community empowerment. Everybody in the community is empowered, all right? Everybody. Another reason why this is important, I've spoken with several law enforcement officers from around the country about this particular provision in Illinois Safety Act. And they tell me they love it. You know why? Because they said to me, their number one go-to when they respond to an in-crisis situation are usually the people who are closest to the person who has mental illness. And that are gonna, those, the, the per, those people are gonna be the family and friends of that person, okay? And the reason why that's important to them is for three reasons. One is they wanna know what's the mental illness. Number two, they wanna know, are there any prescription medications? And number three, most importantly, they wanna know how best can we deescalate? So if you already have the people in the community who are family members of people with mental illness, then they're already learning about how best to deescalate. And they can also get the phone numbers, right, of those family members so that if their family member is in crisis, they can call them on the phone and say, hey, yeah, I remember you from the training. So yeah, your cousin's out here. Remember we talked about this? I just want you to help me with deescalating the situation. That is community empowerment. Everybody's working together to ensure public safety and police accountability. Now, one other thing I wanna say about this is that another reason why this is important is because if we look at the Derek Chauvin trial, okay, there was an African-American gentleman who witnessed uh, Derek Chauvin putting his knee on George Floyd's neck. He's a, a brother who uh, is an MMA professional fighter, okay? He was on the stand and testified during the Derek Chauvin trial, had a very powerful testimony too. Now, if you notice that video, he was yelling at Derek Chauvin while his knee was on George Floyd's neck. And he said to him, I know that you're not supposed to use that technique because I've participated in your use of force training at the academy. And I know they don't teach you to do that. Now that to me speaks to what this training is doing. The one that you're looking at here on the slide, which is bringing community members into the trainings with law enforcement so that they can learn about the trainings. And also when they're out in the out in the street and they see law enforcement engaging with other community members, they know, okay, you're not adhering to the training. You're not adhering to the policy. So that means you're violating it. And now I'm gonna hold you accountable, okay? And I'll be honest with you. I think that was one of the major contributing factors to Derek Chauvin getting a guilty verdict was because that MMA fighter, professional fighter, works with law enforcement with the Minneapolis Police Department and is involved in their use of force trainings, okay? So if we bring more community members into these trainings, we're also gonna be increasing accountability and therefore we are now empowering community members. That's what this is all about. So just one last thing before I wrap it up with you, I just wanna quickly talk about some of the other provisions that I worked on with the Illinois State uh, Legislative Black Caucus that are now law in Illinois under the Safety Act that relate to police accountability, specifically related to the decertification process. I know earlier, uh, I think it was State Representative Pullman was talking about trainings being very important. I would, I would say I agree with him on that. I think databases are important too, but I'll be honest with you, even more important than all of that is making sure that we have a solid decertification process in place 
So that way when law enforcement do not do what they're supposed to do, we can hold them accountable, take away their license, and if need be, make sure they never get it back ever again and cannot go to one police department to another co uh, committing misconduct, okay? So that's what I'm gonna talk about with you because we did that in Illinois. And a lot of that work, I worked with the AG and also Lieutenant Governor's Office, State Attorney General, and the uh, Lieutenant Governor's Office to make this a reality. And I'm hoping other states will replicate it and custom tailor it to their own state law. So number one, now in the state of Illinois, the state entity that's responsible for the licensing and revocation of licensing, or what we would call decertification of law enforcement, it's called the uh, essentially the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission. That's the state entity. Now, civilians, regular civilians, can file a complaint directly with that state entity, which can then begin the decertification process of officers who are accused of misconduct. And to make it even better, civilians can directly engage with that state entity and do it anonymously, meaning that they don't even have to give their name. And that means they don't have to worry about any retaliation from law enforcement. So this, I'll let you right know, Illinois is the first state in the country to do this. No other state allows civilians to directly engage with the state entity responsible for decertifying officers. And they definitely don't allow them to engage with them anonymously. And understand that if it's anonymous or not, it has to be addressed and investigated the same way. Now, something else that's really key about Illinois' law is that civilian oversight authorities as well are able to directly engage the state entity on decertification of law enforcement officers. So that means civilian complaint review boards, like I talked about earlier, can also report any kind of misconduct directly to the state entity instead of having to go through the law enforcement agency. All right, that's really good because now we're gonna start seeing more police accountability. Also understand those civilian oversight authorities now under the Safety Act can also investigate any notices of violations of certification. So if a civilian provides a complaint to the state entity about an officer engaging in misconduct that triggers the decertification process, the Civilian Complaint Review Board can also investigate that notice that came from the civilian. So now in Illinois, I just wanna make sure to emphasize with you, there's not one way, there's multiple ways that civilians can directly engage in the decertification process for law enforcement officers who engage in misconduct. Not one way, but several ways. And I think this should be replicated in more states. This is how one way that we're gonna see more police accountability. Now, one last thing I wanna say, which I think this is the most important part of the Safety Act outside of the training that I just talked about on the last slide. And that is now under the Safety Act, there is created the Law Enforcement Officers Certification Review Panel for decertification. So this is a panel that consists of 11 panelists and four of those panelists have to be community members okay and this panel works alongside the state entity that's responsible for the licensing and decertification of law enforcement and this panel will work alongside that state entity on only on the decertification of law enforcement so taking away their license so that they cannot have law enforcement authority in the state temporarily or even permanently. That depends on the circumstances. So what I want to just kind of emphasize with you is the composition of this panel. Like I said, 11 panelists, at least four of them have to be community members. Out of those four community members under the law, at least two of them must be non-law enforcement affiliated community members from neighborhoods with high levels of negative police interactions. Where does that sound familiar to you? Huh? That's from the CAP method the community empowerment component, right? Now I'm gonna to read to you verbatim what the law under the Safety Act says. It says, two persons who shall be Illinois residents who are from communities with disproportionately high instances of interaction with law enforcement as indicated by a high need, underserved community with high rates of gun violence, unemployment, child poverty, and commitments to the Illinois Department of Corrections, but, who are not themselves law enforcement officers. That is community empowerment written into law. And that's what we need. I mean, it's wonderful to get cases and litigation and win, but at the end of the day, we need long-term solutions to a long-term problem. And that means we need policy change. We need laws on the books on the state and local level, similar to this with this language that has community members essentially from the west side and south side of Chicago 
that are required to be a part of the decision-making process for decertifying officers. I wanna let you know, there is no other state in America right now that allows for that to happen, all right? Illinois is the first, and I'm hoping it's not gonna be the last. Now, it also requires that there's one uh, community member who's uh, from the Crime Victims Advocacy Organization and another one who's not employed at the state attorney general's office. So that makes up a total of four. And the last thing I wanna say on this is that the certification review panel also has subpoena powers. Remember I talked about that earlier. That's very important, okay? So now I'm gonna start wrapping this up. So this brings us to this question. Why is policing reform important? And this picture, which was taken during the uprising in Minneapolis after George Floyd's death. So if we apply the four aspects of the community to this picture being law enforcement, appointed and elected government officials, community members, and the news media, what do we see here? We see law enforcement ready to go with military style gear and weapons and vehicles. On the other side of the street, we see community members of various backgrounds, races and genders, all locked arm in arm in camaraderie as one community. Then we see who's not in the mix, but recording all of this, the news media. And then who's not present, right? Who don't we see here? We don't see the elected and appointed government officials. Now, I believe that this picture is symbolic of policing reform in America today, because to be honest with you, government officials tend to be more so reactive rather than proactive on policing reform. In other words, they tend to show up on policing reform issues after there's been a high profile officer involved shooting or officer involved death or if protests have been mishandled by law enforcement. They tend not to show up on policing reform before that happens. And so this is a pivotal time for our nation in terms of policing. True policing reform is when community members and law enforcement respect each other and work in collaboration as one community to support public safety and ensure police accountability through more so proactive rather than reactive strategies. And this picture would change and really should look different. If we applied the CAP method to it, you'd see law enforcement drop their military style gear and equipment, use that yellow line in the street as a bridge rather than as a divider and lock arm in arm with those community members. We would see the news media, you know, get in the mix, don't be outside of it. Lock arm in arm with those community members and law enforcement. And most importantly, we would see those elected and appointed government officials present right now, locking arm with community members, law enforcement, and the news media, and all of that being recorded so that they are all one community, supporting public safety and ensuring police accountability, okay? Now, in order to accomplish this effort, community empowerment centered policing reform is necessary to address this ongoing power disparity by empowering communities through the CAP method and thus providing long-term solutions to a long-term problem. So to wrap it all up, this is the what? My company's consulting services for state and local legislative grassroots advocacy, all done through the CAP method that I've detailed for you. And then last but not least, this is the how, my contact information ctmayors2 at gmail.com. You know, although I did a simplistic and quick run through of reimagining public safety through community empowerment centered policing reform by applying the CAP method, I am also finalizing a strategy workshop on applying the CAP method to the 21st Century Policing Task Force final report recommendations. Additionally, I provide a presentation on the intersections between policing reform and environmental justice. So thank you, and please do keep in touch. Thank you, Attorney Mayors. Um, you know, what an awesome presentation and, uh, and a wealth of knowledge. And it's been great to work with you, you know, over probably the past decade uh, with the NAACP nationally. Um, you know, there's a couple of questions from, uh, from the media, uh, WDT and TV2, uh, that I'll have uh, her, Caroline Morse, to direct to our moderator this evening. Uh, David Fox and, uh, and also our second vice president, Maddie White, as they have been working with the, uh, they're on the, our criminal justice, uh, you know, criminal justice um, task force. So on criminal justice reform and police accountability. So uh, Caroline, uh, you, you can uh, ask your questions of uh, Chairman Fox and uh, first VP White. 
Perfect. Thank you, doctor. And thank you everyone for letting us help cover um, such an incredible story for the community. Uh, my first question, I only have two. My first one is, you know, the Dayton NAACP has been meeting with law enforcement for, like you said, some time trying to help bridge this gap and get information to everybody. I wanted to ask, have you guys seen any progress? Have you seen any positive influences or not? And just kind of why or why not uh, what you've seen so far? Well, Caroline, I will start first um, uh, and respond to that. Um, you are correct. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, um, I want to uh, give credit to the president of the Dayton Unit NAACP for being somewhat avant-garde, if you will, and taking the lead in uh, the establishment or the development or criminal justice reform and uh, accountability um, a point strategy program. And yes, there have been some meetings with the area chief of police uh, association members, and there is movement. Are we there yet? No, we're not. But there has been some progressive movement in the A point strategy toward the um, uh, points of the criminal justice reform and accountability plan that was drafted by the uh, Dayton unit in AACP. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, Mr. Fox, did you have anything? Yes. Uh, very excited to tell you that Kettering Police Department is doing an excellent job in, in working with the community, just as Attorney Myers was, was talking about in terms of doing that kind of work of community empowerment. And they uh, have assisted Oakwood uh, in in that regard, uh, the chief of Oakwood uh, uh, wanted to have uh, some knowledge about how that was being done in Kettering, and they have gotten together, and they they both were at the table with us, and uh, they are making some great leadway in that regard. Uh, even uh, in the incident at Trotwood, uh, when they had the shooting, uh, we was able to see transparency uh, right away from that police department. Um, so, and they have been at the table also. So there, there are uh, numerous police departments that are uh, doing the best they can do uh, with that eight point strategy. And we are excited about that. And then finally, um, as you may remember of uh, the Citizens Appeal Board with the city of Dayton connected with the police department, of course, uh, did, a, did a great job on what a case that they had recently. So we, we've seen some improvement uh, in the community. Uh, there's a lot of different groups that are calling for police reform, but particularly the NAACP has eight point strategy, which we believe is doable. A lot, a lot of times you put stuff out there that, that just can't be done. And if it can be done, it takes time. But uh, we are excited the fact that we have uh, been able to uh, meet with most of the police agencies within the uh, Montgomery County. There are about 22 agencies, and they have been meeting with us on a continuing basis, and, and they've been very cooperative, and we really appreciate it. That is amazing to hear. And that segues into my next question. I'm sure, like you said, there are plenty of steps this isn't just, oh, one problem is solved, we're done here. No, there, there's plenty more. What did you guys think is probably the most important step in the healing process? What can the community do? What can local law enforcement do to, in your opinion, is the biggest, most important step? And, and before, and as, as they think about that question, uh, you'll kind of let me digress to the first question and yeah. then think about uh, their answer and their response to that. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, even with the body cams, uh, you know, the body cams, uh, there was probably maybe only two agencies, uh, one or two agencies that had body cams before we began our quest with our eight point strategy. Uh, we're now up to about six different law enforcement agencies uh, using body cams or soon to be using body cams. Uh, you know, with the Citizens Review Board, uh, you know, now the city of Dayton is starting to truly utilize the Citizens Review Board uh, to how, uh, to, the, to their intended purpose. Uh, and we've seen that as a result of the Jack Runzer case. So as we look to continue down the path of our eight-point strategy, 
uh, you know, we can say uh, the sheriff's department, uh, they implemented, um, you know, we, part of our eight point strategy was to deal with mental health. And I can tell you that dealing with mental health, uh, you know, the sheriff's department implemented a program where they're having uh, mental health care professionals riding with their uh, deputies in cases where there is uh, some challenges uh, with someone who may have mental health issues. Uh, now, that has now transcended to the Dayton Police Department. And our overall arching goal, or part of our overall arching goal, I can tell you, is that when we uh, chose to put this eight point strategy together to bring all the law enforcement agencies together, even though they already meet, but to have an objective organization uh, to be there to meet with them uh, so that we can hear uh, what it is that they are working on together. It gave us an opportunity to hear what they're currently working on and also gave them an opportunity to hear from one another with us in the room. And then for them and for us to give them some suggestions uh, of improvement, uh, which uh, they have started implementing in various law enforcement uh, agencies throughout the county. So is there progress? Absolutely, there's progress. And uh, we're looking to much more progress. So you can proceed with that next question. Thank you, doctor. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so that segues into my next question. Like you said, there's plenty of steps moving forward. I just wanted to know in your guys' opinion, what would be the most important, you think the most influential, especially on the community and law enforcement? Well, one for um, the realization for both parties, community and the, as particularly the police department that um, it's about public safety. Policing for the community is a service and that service is to um, enact the overall safety of community members that exist. And, you know, and I'll defer to uh, attorneys, um, mayor's uh, composition or definition of community and what the community com is comprised of. Um, also too, um, one of the most important things that we'd like to see is that there's a, there is fair, equitable policing without regards to race, without regards to socioeconomic status, without regards to gender, without regards to uh, mental faculties of stabilities. That people um, that are responsible for providing professional service in the way of policing realize that one, you're dealing with human beings, and that two, that you act professionally and responsibly and be accountable. Uh, it's important too that people's civil rights and human rights are preserved in any interaction between law enforcement and citizens. Very well said, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fox, did you have anything? Yes, um, police basically maintain order. And in order to maintain that order, they have to use force. That's how they're trained. What we are excited about tonight is having a, a model that has been presented to us by attorney mayors that can overcome this problem that we're having in our communities. We basically, we see a shooting of an unarmed uh, black male, and then there's a storm of protests, then there's an investigation, then there's a lawsuit filed, and then we all go back to business as usual. But if we can get uh, into this community empowered uh, policing. Uh, I believe that it can really do a, a great asset to our community to bring about the kind of relations that police and community people need to have. Uh, the police are the public and the public are the police. And so as a result of that, we all got to live together and in so doing, we need to treat each other with dignity and respect. And uh, Caroline, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the one thing, and as I like to hear from a state side, uh, so we have uh, our state president, uh, Tom Roberts, that's on the phone, uh, or, or, not on the phone, but on, the, on this call. And then we also have state representative Phil Plummer uh, on this call. So, uh, so I like to hear from them from a state side, from a state perspective, uh, because even though, because uh, we all we also advocate, uh, you know, on, you know, on state issues. So, so I like to hear from our state president, who also serves as our second vice president locally and our political action chair locally. 
but he's also the state president of the NAACP, which then will fall in line with state Rep representative Phil Plummer. So, perfect. Um, Mr. President, I can comment, but I want to ask Mr. Mayor a question. But let me let me say that um, a, a lot of what we heard tonight are things that the local unit has been advocating for, you know, with subpoena power. Uh, and I think with, with the eight point plan, uh, Dayton is moving in the right direction, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I think I think the cat accountability will be, come into play, you know, with Dayton moving that right right the right direction so i think we're moving the right direction can i ask my question uh of our of our presenter tonight mr president uh, uh yes yes and then we'll go to uh rep plumber go ahead okay and, and and really uh counselor two areas one a lot of us believe that training for police officers needs to be done because they are trained to shoot at critical mass the body here you know, and I was telling President Forward yesterday or the day before, you know, I'm watching Matt Dillon and they shot the gun out of the hand, you know. Mm -hmm. why, why can't we retrain them, the police officers, to do that? You know, why can't we retrain them to shoot at the leg or shoot, you know, at other body parts? That's the first piece of that. But then second one, not being able to do that, when you talk about your, the cat method, um, would then the community be able to have new expectations of police officers, you know, and say, we don't want you to shoot to kill that young person. We want you to shoot to, if you have to shoot, I mean, first of all, use the taser right. or a billy club or something else, you know, and I, and I was told, I was told in any rate, you know, the tasers is usually on your, your, your non-predominant side. You know, and so that's why that other one is so bizarre as to why her taser was on her dominant side or I don't know what she did. But but I guess the question is, OK, should we retrain to not shoot the body mass? Absence of that, do you think your cat method can be used to retrain police officers? If the community says we don't want you to shoot to kill somebody, we want you to shoot to disable you know, and let the, let the court do the, the, the trial and jury. You, so I'm asking two parts. One, but let me just ask you, because you presented on the CAT, absence of retraining, you think then CAT can be used to retrain police officers thinking at the local level? Yes, I definitely can. And I'll be honest with you. So like I said earlier, what I presented to you, those examples within the CAT method, the CAT method itself, that process, that's a new thing. That's something I created. But there's certain aspects of it that I'll be honest with you are not novel. A good example is what you just brought up. So in regards to officer involved trainings, you remember how I said now in Illinois, it's required for crisis intervention techniques that community members are a part of it. Well, guess what? Uh, that's already been happening for years now. If we look at Tucson, Arizona, I know I talked about them earlier, but once again, a red state, they have been allowing community members to participate in their trainings for now going on four years. If you go on their website right now, just Google Tucson, Arizona Police Department, right on their front web page, they will talk about in detail how they have community members involved in different act police activities within their police department, one of which are community participation and use of force trainings. Now, why is that important? Because at the end of the day, if they're not, if they're only being trained by law enforcement and they're not getting direct feedback, from community members, which essentially is a quality control mechanism, right? We want to make sure that whatever we have in place is actually working up to quality standards, right? Who's going to be able to tell you that but a patron, but a customer? In this case, a community member, right? That's who law enforcement serves. When you have them a part of the trainings, they're able to actually provide that quality control feedback. Now, to make it even better in Tucson, Arizona, they don't only allow them to participate in the trainings, they also have a civilian oversight authority that they call an SERB, I think it's Centennial, I forgot what the ERB stands for, but essentially what it is, it's an a, a, a oversight committee that annually does a review and audit of that police department's activities to determine if there's any areas that need improvement and how they're going to go about troubleshooting that. And they draft up a report 
that is publicized every year with their findings and recommendations. And that helps law enforcement and the community to be on the same page for what they're gonna do to make those changes. One other thing I wanna say that actually relates directly to NAACP. In 2014, when I was directing NAACP's national program, uh, the New Jersey State Conference was invited by the New Jersey State Police to participate in their firearm training. So this was the first time that community members participated in a firearm training for the New Jersey State Police. And so there's actually, if you look it up on Google, there's three articles that were drafted up about that training that includes pictures of the NAACP members, including at that time, Chairwoman Rosalind Brock. I'm sure all of you remember her, yep. She also participated in that training. So it's funny seeing, you know, in one of the articles, uh, they show pictures of her with like in the module with the fake gun and she's like pointing it, trying to decide if she's gonna pull the trigger or not. And the reason why that's important and that they talk about this in the articles is because it allows the community members to be in the foot in, the, in the, the, the shoes, I should say, of law enforcement to understand what's going on when you have to make that split second decision. But it also allows community members to provide feedback in the moment to law enforcement, pretty much saying to them, okay, I see I'm shooting the gun. Yeah, the person had a knife, but can I just shoot them on the leg? Like, why do I have to shoot them center mass? In my opinion, when you have community members a part of trainings like what they did in New Jersey, what they've done in Tucson and are still doing, what they're going to be doing in Illinois because of the law now, right? That allows for that discourse and conversation to happen proactively, right? Which is going to ultimately result, in my opinion, in fewer deaths because when you have law enforcement that are receptive like that, then you're going to see those kind of necessary reforms being implemented. So I, I do believe that when you have them a part of the trainings, like has been done already, that it shows that you see changes that are necessary to make sure to solidify the confidence and trust between community members and law enforcement, especially as it relates to use of force. Thank you. Uh, I'll yield, uh, Mr. President, because I have a second question, but I want to hear uh, Representative Plummer and others, and, if, if, and at the end, I'll ask a second question. So I'll yield to, to uh, Representative Plummer or whoever else you want to go to. Thanks, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Uh, Rep. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Mayor, thanks for your um, presentation. That was awesome. I took some great notes. Um, my, my bill here in Ohio kind of replicates what you, you did over there in Indiana and Illinois. So uh, helps on the way. But you guys, what we got what we have to do is we have 26,000 police officers in Ohio. Um, majority of them are good officers. So we need to lift up the good officers and also hold the ones that aren't so good accountable. We all can agree to that. But we also need to make a more of an investment in the whole criminal justice system. You know, you talked on some key points on training, mental health issues. Um, I think 50% of our officers in Montgomery County now have crisis intervention training. You know, we're asking a lot of these officers, we, we need a more investment and have more police officers out there because they're going call to call to call and they're seeing negative call after negative call and it does it does bring them down so we got to lift them up we got to hold the bad ones accountable but lift up the good ones because i have a real concern for the profession people are leaving it people are leaving it and then what do we do you know it's kind of like we chase all the referees off who referees in sports games that our kids play so let's lift up the good let's hold the bad accountable and you guys are making great progress but you guys know you discussed Oakwood Kettering, this is all personal, personal relationships we have to build in our communities. And you guys, you guys speak, people listen. And the most important part is the citizens are the bosses. They pay the taxes. They pay for these services. So we need more citizen input on policies, training, officer development. We're getting there. We're moving the ball, you guys. But do me a favor and let's also lift up the good officers. Thanks. And uh, now I can tell you that I did participate. Uh, in Attorney Maris, uh, you know, Dayton, Dayton did have a, a you know, simulation training. Uh, they they do allow uh, the citizens to participate. I can't say they allow all citizens, but I did have an opportunity to participate. Uh, and I do know that it is a split second decision. Uh, you know, because I can tell you, I probably uh, shot the wrong person a couple of times. Uh, you know, and. Um, you know, so so I know how hard it is, uh, but I'm not a law enforcement officer either. Whereas I'm constantly going through the training uh, to really understand what to look for and things like that. So uh, I think it would be good for for any citizen if they have the opportunity to go through that training uh, to see what it's like to um, 
uh, to disarm the bad person and um, uh, or to shoot the bad person. Now, I know typically a law enforcement you know agency will say they won't say shoot to kill. They're gonna say stop the threat, but stop the threat basically means shoot to kill. Uh, you know uh, because if you shoot somebody center mass. Uh, you know, the, their, their chances of survival are, you know, are not that great. But in some cases, if the Lord decides to spare someone's life, uh, then that's what he will do, like he spared my, my cousin's life. So, um, uh, you know, so uh, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, I would encourage anybody, in, even the people on this call, if you can go through that simulation training, to go through it, uh, to kind of understand what law enforcement officers actually go through on the split section decisions as well. Um, and, um, I, you know, it's very, you know, it's, it's hard, uh, you, you know, now I'm quite certain that, that they probably got to go through it several times, uh, you know, if they make a mistake and maybe shoot another officer or, or whatever the case may be, you know, during that training, uh, you know, but it's possible, you know, so you got to be accurate and you got to be fluent and, and, uh, you have to understand how that system works. So, um, I'll be the first to say, and I can, and I can be the first to say, uh, that I support law enforcement because my father was a police officer. So, um, so I really supported, uh, I have supported law enforcement officers uh, my entire life. Uh, you know, as a, as a little kid growing up in Jefferson Township, my father ride around his police car. So, you know, I, you know, I really respect law enforcement, but if law enforcement officers are not doing the right thing, that's when we got to make certain they're held accountable. And that's the part, and that's the piece that people are upset about is the accountability factor. And that's why I like uh, the legislation, you know, that uh, Rep. Plummer is going to be proposing, you know, uh, you know, and, and and I believe there's something that we can get behind. Uh, there's other bills that we're going to talk about tomorrow that maybe we don't support, uh, you know, and and here's another thing. If we think about, you know, the bill that uh, Governor DeWine, uh, you know, just signed into law not too long ago, the Stand Your Ground bill, uh, think about the Columbus case. Think about this young lady, Brianna, uh, who called the police because she said that there's people at her house there to stab her. Well, she was standing her ground at her house. Unfortunately, when the police officers got there, the police officers didn't know who was standing their ground. The police officers only could see somebody is about to stab somebody else. But was this person standing their ground? They called, they made the telephone call. She was standing her ground based upon the call, but then she gets shot and killed. So that's why we as NAACP really thought that standing your ground was bad legislation. Uh, and I hope uh, that we continue to drive that point home to our, our, you know, the governor, because in, in my opinion, you had somebody who stood their ground made a phone call before standing their ground, made a phone call, then stood their ground and ultimately became the victim of homicide. Go ahead, uh, President Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the second question, uh, Mr. Mayor, goes to the whole issue of FOP, the unions, and um, the, the Citizens Review Board and subpoena power. And so how have other communities uh, been able to, to address that? I mean, why, look, we're dismantling unions left and right all over the world, all over the country, all over the states, decreasing their membership. Why is FOP uh, union in a, in a, so, so strong in those regards, but how can we push for the system review boards with subpoena power when cities are faced with FOP contracts that says you can't. Right, and so um, in Illinois, what they did with their the current legislation, the Safety Act that was passed into law, they actually stated in writing in the law that there were specific provisions related to use of force, related to um, civilian complaints, et cetera, that, and also, also related to sheriffs, like certification of sheriffs that essentially said that uh, the provisions within the law preempt the police union contracts. And the way that works in Illinois is that 
the existing police union contracts that are currently in existence that have not expired yet, those provisions are not going to kick in for the existing police union contract. But once it comes time for those contracts to get renewed, or once it comes time for a very new contract, because you never know, right? They might say, well, we want to do a brand new contract. We want to renew what we did last time. Either way, in either situation, that's when the state law provisions will kick in and apply to those. And that's when they will preempt. In other words, they would you know, uh, trump the, uh, the police union contract language. Now, I also want to raise with you another thing, which was that originally, when the uh, Illinois Safety Act was drafted, it was uh, originally HB 163. What ended up passing the law was HB 3653. Uh, HB 163 actually had language in it that specifically said that police union contracts would not have any governance over any matters that were related to uh, investigations of misconduct by law enforcement, hmm. disciplinary records, and discipline of law enforcement, okay? Now, I'm gonna let you know the reason specifically in Illinois why that was made possible was because last year, there was a decision that came down from the Illinois Supreme Court that essentially said that those provisions cannot be governed by private contract and have to be governed by state law because of the significant public policy impact that they have. And I'll be honest with you, if there's any evidence to back that decision up, what I would say to people is go back last year to what happened after George Floyd died and that video was released all around the world. What did we see in every city in America and almost every city in the world? Massive protests that lasted weeks, all right? Not one day, but days and weeks at a time. If there's not evidence enough that this stuff has a significant public policy impact, that to me is the evidence. So because of that, Illinois originally had that included in the original draft of the Safety Act, but because of negotiations, like you just said, President Roberts, with the police union contract and the lobby, they ended up extracting that language. And instead what they did is they replaced it with the language that I talked about with you saying that under the existing union contracts, those provisions would not kick in. They would have to kick in once those existing union contracts expire. And now there's a new police union contract or, or, or it's been renewed. The old one's been renewed. At that point, the new state law provisions would kick in and that would trump the police union contract. So, I mean, right now, that is the thought process when it comes to how we can address this on the state level. At the end of the day, state law trumps police union contracts. And I would say more specifically to look at the uh, collective bargaining agreement law, every state has one. And I would always say, to, I'd also say to look at the open meetings law. Those are the two laws that need to be amended if you wanna do anything related to police union contracts and trying to divest their governance over investigations of misconduct, discipline and disciplinary records. Illinois might have been one of the first states to do it, but I know Texas, they're doing a lot of work there based on the work in Austin, Texas and Travis County. And there's other states now doing something similar. So this is not like, I know unions are kind of going crazy because, you know, because of George Floyd and all the protests, people are now like galvanized to take on the unions. And now they have Illinois' uh, Supreme Court case to give them something to work with, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Fox, back to you, and then uh, then, then you can give back to me, me once you're done. Well, we had a great night. A lot of information was brought out. But I can tell you, uh, <laughs> President Roberts, uh, shooting somebody in the arm is not going to be an easy thing to do. And uh, number one and number two, the police officer, when he does or she uses their weapon, the reason why they shoot at the critical mass is because they got to be concerned about citizens who might be close by. And if you shoot it, try to shoot at somebody's arm and you miss and hit some innocent bystander, 
then you really got a problem. Now, um, Attorney Mayors, uh, we really appreciate you coming on tonight uh, with this conversation that not only has done NAACP well, but hopefully some um, some citizen in the community, uh, along with our commission, or maybe even the mayor, has an opportunity to see this information. And hopefully, uh, if so, we might can merge it into our uh, our process here in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we are we are a progressive city. Or at least we're trying to be. And we are about to get a new police chief. And uh, this is a great time to to bring something like this to our community. Uh, we had a, a great chief and Chief Bill who came from Cincinnati, who brought some of the collaborative that we talked about earlier to Dayton, Ohio. And uh, in regards to what President Ford said, uh, my, myself, I graduated from three police academies, but I went to Dayton's um, Citizens Police Academy, and that was a great opportunity for citizens in the community to go through scenarios, learn information about how police operate. And I'm like President Ford, I recommend that any and every citizen in the city who is willing to go should go because when they had the scenarios about how to respond to uh, incidents that called for deadly force, just about every citizen that was there did the same thing that President Ford did. They shot up everybody. So, you know, it's not always as bad as it seems. We got to understand each person's point of view. And that's the great thing that we can do is we can learn from what the police uh, have to give us and, and the police can learn from what the citizens have to give them. And I contend that if that is the case, we will have a better society. That's my comment for, for the evening. And I'll see y'all next year, uh, if the Lord wills. Back okay. to you, President Ford. Well, uh, you know, Chairman Fox, uh, you know, once again, uh, you know, another awesome um, monthly community meeting where we inform, educate, and empower the community. Uh, you know, outstanding job. And, uh, you know, to your guests, uh, and your attorney, Carlton T. Mayors, the second, uh, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, you, you. Like I said, we've been knowing each other for a long time. You work with me, I think, on the John Crawford case, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think that was yeah. one of the cases you worked with me on. And um, certainly appreciate everything uh, you know, that you're doing nationally, uh, you know, because you've been you're at the national level and uh, you know, Lord has placed you there for a reason. So, so uh, I, you know, and and what I was telling somebody, matter of fact, I'm gonna share this with you because I told this to someone today um, that I think I should share with you. Uh, I, you know, that is you were not someone. Typically, when people give national status, sometimes they're too good to reach back to the local guys, you know, and um, or gals. But I can say unequivocally that you have maintained this relationship with me, uh, you know, from your national status with NAACP, and then going out, uh, you know, working in other uh, arenas uh, in criminal justice to now owning your own consulting firm. So. I appreciate you continually reaching out to me, sending me text messages, giving me calls. Hey, President Ford, what do you think about this? Uh, I really appreciate you, my brother. So I uh, you know, just know that from Dayton to Chi Town, that uh, that I appreciate you. So just want to tell you that. Thank you. I appreciate you too, sir. Definitely. I want to continue. Look forward to continuing to work with you. Yes, sir. So that uh, uh, next month, I think we're next month is. Uh, May, and I believe May is community coordination, I believe. Uh, so, so Maddie P. White, uh, who's our first vice president and chair of community coordination, 
uh, will be putting together her panelists and uh, coming up with her own topic uh, for engaging the community next month in the month of May. So with that, uh, see everybody later. I hope you had a great time and uh, Godspeed to all of you. And Rep. Rep Plummer, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, on the call tomorrow. If you can get those names to me so I can get, the, get that flyer together, that'd be great. Thank you. I put my contact information in the chat for everybody as well. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.